breaking, marrying each other. But yeah, it was a uh, Kevin threw the first light on. And I was like, oh hey, <laughs> you know what we could do? <laughs> now don't move. <laughs> hey, yeah, don't move. Don't move. <laughs> yeah, it's so. uh, really sentimental when you um, when you compare the two positionalities, right? There's such a distance here, and then uh, the closeness in storytelling. Yeah. Any questions before we move on? Again, uh, anybody online can question us through the comments section. Okay. Shall we orchid? Yeah. This was important to me as I was laying it out that these rapids are near this orchid because it's, um, this, this would be unquestioned. It's somehow more scientific and this is more mythological thinking. Sure. And yeah. I think that's the, the function of an art practice, especially one as kind of rigorous as yours, is that those two modes of thinking don't have to be in separate yeah. schools. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Let's kind of look at this orchid. Next to you. Oh, there you go. Good. Uh, okay, so this was, I think, maybe the first thing that came to me when I started to think about the other Kali Yuga pieces I wanted to do. So this is where we get into the idea of like a copy of 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 a copy, sort of in, ad infinitum. I had seen. So this this is a reproduction of what was originally a web comic that was then printed in Donna Haraway's book, Staying with the Trouble, and the webcom, it's Randall Monroe, I think his name is, it's uh, XLCD, I think it's his pen name, and it sort of tells the story in this really poetic way of uh, the species of bee orchid that the sort of the central part of the flower evolved to look like this very particular female of a very particular species of bee, and the bee has since gone extinct, so the Orchid is still kind of capable of reproducing asexually, but it is likely destined for extinction as well. And so what the text on this says basically is the, the girl figures explaining to the boy figures sort of all of this. And then um, the, the, the male figure says like, oh, so it's a portrait of a bee drawn by a flower that's basically about to vanish. And then in the last sort of series, he's saying, I'll remember your bee and I will remember you. And so. I think that's it's. I couldn't put it any better <laughs> than Randall Monroe did. So did a drawing of the digital web comic as printed in the book, ripped out of the book, and then and then made my version of the the bee orchid, and that's cobbled together from um, a, again sort of found floral parts that have been cut up and reassembled, and a little bit of wool, some resin, and then. I know everyone, someone is definitely going to point out that that is actually a piece of a wasp nest and is definitely actually a piece of a wasp nest, <laughs> but I found it on a walk uh, as I was working on this and just sort of threw it in the box and brought it and I thought there's just something, you know, because even though it is a wasp nest, the honeycomb kind of says something about bees, so, yeah. so it's yeah. there with it. Yeah. And um, really speaks to your, your collecting as part of your art practice, I think, right? Um, yeah. So when yeah. we say found objects, we literally mean found objects. You purchase some things, but quite often, but, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Your practice is, is kind of assemblage in some in some cases. Yeah. Um, yeah. I always get goosebumps when I when I read this one in particular, as opposed to when I just hear about it. Right. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's it's done as a dialogue. Yeah. Right. This yeah. is why Donna Haraway needed to use it instead of just describing it. This is why yeah. you need to use it instead of describing it is because these two people are having a conversation and. And that, that communicates the relationality of the bee and the orchid, I think, better than, than description can. Yeah. Um, and this will come up many times in the exhibition, this exhibition practice where the orchid is just suspended and spotlit. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've learned the vocabulary word cenotaphic display, so that's what you'll see in kind of history museums or science museums when something, you know, is, is, exists and then is taken out of context and, yeah. and put on informational display, right, right, as opposed to an emotional display. Yeah. Yeah. Good, no questions? Good. Melt? <laughs> yeah, <to> sure. <laughs> I'm going out of numerical order, I think. It, I mean, I think this is six. Geographic yeah. makes, <laughs> geographically makes sense. So 
this was the last piece in the series done because it was done entirely here. Yes. <laughs> Did not it exist not in the essay because a week we ago. Sure. <laughs> yes, it, well, we weren't sure if it was going to come in or not. Yeah. Um, I did have an inkling about the idea of the footage of those really skinny, sad, starving polar bears that sort of made the rounds of the news, um, well, I guess almost 10 years ago now. Yeah. And I had, this is one of the few pieces of real fur in, in, in this installation, um, but it also came from the secondhand store. I think it was like 10 bucks or something. Yeah, <laughs> the Renaissance and yeah, yeah 995 in the <laughs> Price tag was still on it. I don't know what it's actually made out of. I'm not sure what has that long white fur that you're allowed to kill in that number because it's definitely like pieced together uh, in the back. Yeah. But to me, it had, because of the sort of different lengths and the slightly creamy color, like had kind of like a polar bear vibe yeah. to it. And just the idea that you would take something like that and make it into a square rug. Um, sort of sad. The uh, skull is totally ceramic. It's actually green still, so it is unfired. Um, it was the last thing that I made here last week, and it is thick and heavy and was not going to dry in time to go in the kiln and possibly would have exploded if we had, yeah. so just calling it part of the work. Yeah. So instead it's fragile, which is appropriate. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then I snuck this little rock in at the last minute, I think just because it needs something else. I brought it with me. Uh, I spend I have sort of a, like, I don't know, working, psychic, whatever, tie to Newfoundland and spent a bunch of time there. So that rock came from those shores and um, they have kind of a saying about the stones with the, the, the lines through it, um, the wishing rocks that you're supposed to throw back in the sea and make a wish and maybe the wish comes true. Yeah. But they also, I think, I don't know if they have a saying about the ones that actually really look like eyes like that, but to me, it reminded me of the, uh, the Zobids that, um, like that they, they sort of trade in, in Tibet and stuff, and there are sort of all this kind of meaning in that as well, like a, a rock that has a natural eye. Yeah. But, yeah. So I, I think it makes so much sense as an assemblage because you have this shrine, yeah. and then it's gone asymmetrical and sharing space with this wish yeah. that's also a return to the ocean. Right? Yeah. I yeah. think there's, there's uh, plenty of excellent parallels. Because the interesting thing about those pictures of the starving polar bears is that they were denigrated later for being you know yeah. propaganda for the fuzzy ones as opposed like as though <laughs> right caring about the polar bears makes us care less or do less for the you know the yeah yeah i got definitely bugs. got sucked <laughs> into yeah. the internet just wars. because they're fluffy <laughs> yeah. yeah right and oh Whatever it was very it specifically oh you get like you know young women to feel sad about it like um, um oh my god i'm suddenly blowing her name pamela anderson yes yeah but um yeah with the seals yeah perhaps. And, right, yeah. so kind of a shrine, um, kind of a wish. Um, but yeah, yeah, very recent. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, kind of a memorial. Right. Yeah. Um, so something that you can't really tell in uh, the separation of these football fish, these angler <laughs> fish, is that they're all um, distinct. Yep. You didn't sure. follow a kit, but when, when all three of them are together, they're actually quite different, I think, since we're just visiting another football fish right now. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it's worth, there's a really big one, and then there's a, a one that looks very small. They're huge, though, all of them, right? Um, yeah. Life size. Um, they're more? also made out of wool. They have yeah. almost no internal structure. It's just stuffed with more wool. Um, and the teeth are actually made out of um, stiffened faux fur uh, that someone gave me a bag of at some point not stiffened, but normal. And then the tongue is actually rawhide, so it's dyed, dyed rawhide, but it got looked very dead. So. Very dead looking, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, and another, that, that tongue in particular was what, yeah, what came up before. Did yeah. you use a real tongue? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it is real skin, I guess, because it's rawhide, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, I know I stepped out for a second as you were talking about footsteps, but before we get to the yeah. ciphers, yeah. Um, let's, let's, Decisions that are different than what you what you did before here. So oh yeah, um, we have. I don't want to do too much comparing to uh, the now, but um, the difference is the soil. The yes, boxes. yes. There's it's act, it, the com, it's the same components, but I didn't use all of the com components in Trois Rivières because the those two rooms would have you know fit between I think like three of these pillars. Um, the, I had done sort of a contraption of, of, you know, chicken wire and burlap and stuff to be able to house the speakers inside it. 
there, but the floor was also this very orange wood, so the footsteps actually worked not quite as well. And I think I was thinking about those footsteps coming here <laughs> when I made them the color mm. that they are. Um, so yeah, this is the full sort of span as it was originally intended to be. Um, decided to go with the gravel and the soil here because we, you know, kind of had this space to be able to um, do the stagey, uh, more sort of natural history museum like display. Um, the little plinths and the cardboard boxes were Lucy's brain flash <laughs> because we had pots that just didn't look right and then returned the pots and she said, what if we just stick them in cardboard boxes? So yeah. I think that works really well just with the, you know, the so, um, Amazon moment that we're in right now. Right, and absolutely. <laughs> um, and this, although you're very coastal, in your mm -hmm. connections to the land, this yeah. is Great Lakes, um, yeah. and it's a post-industrial marshland, yeah. right? It's, it's a swamp. Um, so it's, it's this combination of, of different ecosystems as far as your connection to them and yeah. um, your understanding of the sciences. Mm -hmm. So swamps or any kind of delta are, are where these garbage piles do collect. So they often do, this, yeah, um, for sure. Blend yeah. of of the the man-made and and the natural, and then the that stuff that lives in the middle, like toxic algae, right? right. That's man-made, right, right, but right. it's technically an organism. A living organism. For sure. And I mean, I am not from the Great Lakes area, but I mean, having lived in Montreal for so long and then spent a lot of time in Toronto and some of the other towns mm -hmm. along those lake shores, she did a residency at Artscape Gibraltar, which is on Toronto Island, which is such a funny place that is so not like Toronto at all, yeah, yeah. but is right there. and. I was there in short, sort of a shoulder season. It does, but yeah. like, yeah, so there's parts that are like windswept beachy, but then there's definitely like garbage gyres that form on the side of the island too. So like some of the beaches will be kind of pristine, but then others you'll be, like, it must be the tidal patterns or whatever. Yeah, all kinds of stuff. And all that pleasure up. craft, sometimes you'll just see like that iridescent sheen yeah. in an otherwise yeah, yeah, pristine. Yeah. Yeah. When I was there for some reason, I don't know, like, I'm like, I, there's obviously a story behind this. I don't know what it is. It, this one beach was just full of coconuts. <laughs> it's like, someone had a coconut party on a boat and like, I mean, I don't know, there's like 20 of them, like 30 of them just scattered. Yeah, really strange. So you're like, uh, the proximity of this enormous city to this sort of like, not pristine or, but kind of wild place. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, time for ciphers then. Time, time for cipher. Time for ciphers. So cipher has many meanings, but here it's intended as a thing outside of a, a consciousness yeah. that that holds some of that willpower, right? That that um, something like a golem, right? You, you put your your sorrow, you put your blame yeah. on an object. So this is this is called the cipher series. I'm kind of like. I would say these are the most sort of consciously symbolic pieces in the show and conceive these relatively late in the game. I mean, in sort of a backwards way, because I knew I was going to have the opportunity to come here for a couple of weeks beforehand, work in the ceramic studio, work with Kevin Conlin. I've been wanting to get back into ceramics after having really not done it since high school, you know, throwing like very ugly pots. And um, uh, so I was like, what can I do that's in ceramic. Like what can I make intentionally instead of finding and making it work? Yeah, and also like it was going to be materially distinct from the rest of the work. So it's like how how could how to how to make that sort of conceptually make sense mm -hmm. in the same show. So I was like, oh they have, you know, this talisman kind of quality to them. Which is obviously, you know, I'm gonna make something smaller if it's gotta go in a kiln as opposed to be, you know, assembled in my <laughs> studio and carry it up the stairs. So what's here <laughs> are basically symbolically is an Ouroboros, an egg that is Pandora's box opened and uh, a scarab beetle. And so, but with a sort of like natural historical and museum kind of like spin on it. Um, snakes, as it turns out, when you Google Ouroboros, do sometimes eat themselves. And nobody, again, really knows why. And you'd think they would notice before they got most of the way through their body, but it happens often enough that there's quite a few videos of this online. Yeah. So again, this is taken from a still from a, 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 I think it's a speckled king snake that yeah. tried to eat itself. Two thirds, two thirds of the way and it was still alive. Still alive, but also not having noticed? Like, I would think, I think that you would notice. It was like, shoot, but like, it what do I do now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Two thirds it got 
So there's that sort of the magical, but also the macabre in that. Um, this is a very, this is actually a very specific egg. It is a great auk egg, and the, the auk is now extinct. And a number of the eggs were collected, sort of in the various collections in the last century of its existence. And this one in particular is called Spallanzani's egg, and it's one of the one of the ones in the collection uh, at the Natural History Museum in Tring. Um, so the little annotations and stuff are, are from the various, uh, I guess, you know, notes of prominence and things that, that when people used to just write directly on the specimen, I guess. Um, Those eggs are interesting because they were collected before they were extinct. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because people knew they were going to go extinct. Yeah. Like, it's just so sad. It's really like, sad. The, the last one was just, like, stepped on by a fisher. <laughs> the last like, egg. Like, accidentally. Not, like, on purpose. Mad, I think, yeah. Because, yeah. oh, like, so. he wasn't getting the money he wanted for it or something. More, more, yeah, more humans behaving badly. <laughs> <laughs> more behaving badly. But, uh, the one object that's really a, a, like a kind of amalgam of a bunch of different existing objects is, the, is Pandora's box, which I guess in the original Greek, the word pithos is actually a storage jar and not like the box that it's sometimes drawn as. So um, it's just sort of an amalgam of a bunch of different uh, pithoi that that, you know, images I just found online. Um, I coil built that because I really can't throw to save my life. And, uh, and it's iron stain that uh, Kevin very much was responsible for having me know that that was a thing I could do as opposed to glazing. Um, so it really is iron oxide. And then the scarab uh, was created in pieces and it mimics uh, an atlas beetle. So just, they are not quite that big, but they are very, very big. And um, just because I wanted something more natural historic looking as opposed to like faux Egyptian or something. So yeah, like I said, and we did this. I came with these two as greenware um, on Monday. Everything else happened here over the last week and a half. So yeah, um, tightly scheduled, long days. Tightly scheduled, yes, a lot of help. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gallery sitting, so yeah. Um, so that completes the tour of the objects. Uh, obviously, there's another fish here, and we didn't get to get close to the owl, which I encourage you to do. But we can also talk. This is such a great um, series to reflect on that combination of uh, cyclical and linear worldviews that right, you're right, interested right. in here. So you were talking about a hope last night. Right. I was talking about what happens if you don't let yourself hope at the end, if you just let yourself sit in these bad feelings, right. in, this, in this environmental despair, you know? Um, and, yeah. and the question is basically the difference between a cyclical worldview, which is the Hindu cosmology, um, uh -huh. where everything has to get real bad and then you get a rebirth, and it takes a really long time when you compare it to the length of human life, um, but not as long as, say, like a Judeo-Christian eternity. Right, right. Where you're like a distinct beginning and a distinct end, yeah. and then just like forever in either direction yeah. <laughs> of no change after or yeah. before that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, so all of that's I forgot to say that. So the symbolic register of all of these objects is basically some version of either regeneration or cyclical time or rebirth, you know. And even the Pandora's box. Um, the part of the story that is often not told is like after letting all the, the demons and horrors out into the world, the one thing that was supposed to have been trapped in the jar was hope, right? So, and I feel like that's, um, we were joking about whether it's under the lid right now or yeah. <laughs> if we were gonna put a little something in the bottom yeah. of the jar, we didn't do that at the end, but yeah. Yeah, so. but this idea that so, all, the, all the bad stuff is out there and that's a forever and a linear, yeah. but if you're going cyclical, then you can return to the jar and, and, and right. find that thing that was stuck behind, right? Yeah. Um, and the scarab was, uh, was used as, as a symbol of, of the afterlife, um, which did include regeneration ultimately in ancient Egyptian cosmology. Yeah, and um, yeah, the, and and the, the, the play on the real snake and the symbol of the Ouroboros, which is supposed to be about eternity, because it's impossible, right? That's, that's yeah. why Ouroboros works as a symbol right. for regeneration for, for foreverness is because a snake couldn't eat its own tail because then it would die and wouldn't be able to eat. Yeah. <laughs> and yet it happens. So yeah. It does sometimes Where's happen. the uncanny yeah. there? Yeah. 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 For sure. Yeah. Um, I ask again for questions. 
I can keep talking about this for a long time. <laughs> the interesting thing that I found out about uh, Kali Yuga in my research is that um, uh, this cycle, the, the Chatter Yuga, the whole four cycles, um, at the end of the dawn of that, so about 12% of, of the way in, um, a twelfth of the way in rather, uh, would have been about when Australopithecus emerged from, from our, our records, and also that accompanies the first tools that were ever made. When you go forward millions of years, humans existed through the, the cycle before, but that's the moment the Kali Yuga begins is when you get the first records of writing, right? Mm. So you have this kind of correlation between tools and writing, um, which I think is really interesting for things like Pandora's Box, where you really have to it, it's, it's discouraging to hear these stories about the search for knowledge being the source of the downfall, right? Right. And I think yeah. um, and there's yeah. certain opinions about that too. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes. Yeah. But no, but definitely that. Um, oh, my thought just evaporated. It might come back to me. But, but I mean, that's the beautiful thing about a cyclical war is is you can kind of reconcile that by saying you can learn as much as you want. It's just going to get worse. But then your rebirth, right? The beginning, oh, the golden right. age is going to be because it follows the darkness, the dark age, right. it's too much wisdom. It already right. has all that wisdom carried into it, right? It's right. just a new, right. a new application. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking of. So I, it has been a theme in, in previous cycles of work for me, the sort of where, where were the beginnings of the mess that we find ourselves in now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, is it, the, is it just our nature? Is it like, because there's so many, you know, I think about uh, when I did my thesis work, it was about the Dutch sort of golden age of still life and stuff. And I was looking at it as the beginning of like the beginning of the arc of globalization that is like crashing down around us all right now. And there are a lot of obviously ter terrible things that we all know about, about that whole arc and colonization and everything. But then there was also, you know, there were, th there were things like the spirit of exploration or reaching out and trying to go yeah. new places and learn new things. And it's like, does that have to end where we are now? Yeah. So that's something that's been on my mind for many, many years. And I think is, yeah, it definitely exists in this show too. Yeah. But um, it's basically does nobody any good if you get too depressed to get out of bed though, right? So it's sort yeah. of like you need some way of yeah. being able to still engage the world yeah. as, as, as terrible as it is to open up the news every day, yeah. basically. And I'm American, so I'm like, oh, yeah. another shooting, great. <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean, that's my morning, like, oh, okay, yeah. you know, so, but yeah. you, you still gotta get out of bed and like do the best you can with your life. Yeah, so. your day can be good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 your, my day might be fine, but yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, there's always those tensions, I think, for me. Any but. thoughts, guys? Yeah. I don't know, I just think Absolutely. It's not, you know, you didn't make the most perfect, wonderful, healthy, now just blooms on flowers. It's paintings made raggedy, almost dead. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to repeat that for people online. Um, the comment was about Van Gogh's sunflowers um, being raggedy, being imperfect, reminding us of all of these things. And I'll, I just taught Van Gogh in my class yesterday. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and said that you know he kind of painted sunflowers because he was trying to decorate his home and make it welcoming because he was trying to start an artistic coming. And he still he couldn't stand the artifice of perfect sunflowers, right? So that yeah, absolutely themes of regeneration. Yeah. And and, and it's true of all of those Dutch still life. Yeah. Bloom's still live in too, right? There's yeah. usually some that are decaying and petals that are falling and yeah. stuff. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. Right. Oh. Yeah. So hard, hard to not try to find some hope, eh? Yeah. It's really hard. Uh, it's almost impossible, I think, to, to end and go. So, yeah. <laughs> doom. Doom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. doom. And all the time scales, I think, when you're, when you, this is certainly true for me when I, have have dived deeply into something my uh, my master's thesis was uh started 125 million years ago at the formation of this thing and everything other than that time scale started to seem really quick to me right? yeah so when you deal with the kali yuga which is uh four million three hundred twenty thousand you know years yeah. the full cycle right so that's where you get after Pithecus comes in um everything else seems short you know yeah. We are, I mean, the, all of everything that's familiar to us is like the blink of an eye, right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, there's that too. Yeah. It's eternal. But.
But as you say, every day has to matter. Or, right, yeah. what are we doing here? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Can you talk about the uh, muscles? Yes, OK, yes. Oh, this is a question about the muscles. In the so there are two species of muscle, uh, funny enough, quaffa muscles and zebra mussels, which is funny because they're both sort of stripy, stripy equine beasts um, that were something that were accidentally introduced into the Great Lakes water system. Um, I think it is as in their larval form from the ballast coming out of all the shipping, uh, big cargo ships that were pl plowing back and forth. So invisible, un completely unintentional. Um, but they're they have the taken Europe. over. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think that, you know, whatever, from the, in their ecosystem, they aren't holy terror, but then being introduced into a brand new ecosystem. And they just, they grow so fast and they encrust everything. Like they will grow over the native mussels that, that live in the, the um, Great Lakes. They um, it can get onto people's uh, boats and things. So I guess like the signs and stuff about really making sure you drain and clean and bleach your boat before you move it from one waterway to another are uh, usually that. Um, and so they're all, they're all handmade. So I spent <laughs> quite a bit of time doing that. <laughs> and it's a two-part epoxy. So they're actually not painted. It's, uh, um, there's uh, indie ink mixed into it. And you then... can tell they're quagga mussels because quagga mussels are um, curved on both sides and zebra mussels are flat on one side. Just to yes. make things harder for herself. <laughs> <laughs> she had one side fat. <laughs> I guess I could have just poured them in a mold or something. Yeah, exactly. but, um, yeah and so they're sort of, you know, the, supposed to sort of be a progression, you know, as it walks along of getting more and more encrusted. And then there's the, the piece of detritus that's just like covered in it. Um, um, so the, the main disruption is that they build. When they, 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 well, they choke out so everything much. else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I they, think they, there's no literal space for anything else. Yeah, and they're, they're terribly easy to spread, I think that's the other thing. Right? It's interesting that the mussels, they say that Lake Erie is actually cleaner now since the mussels have come. Yep, they are and filters. That's so part of what we think it's not. It occurred to me the cycle of destruction and regeneration. Right. Not that they've been good for the natural ecosystem, they've been horribly destructive. Right. And they've messed up a lot of our pipes and all kinds of other stuff. And it's interesting right. to me that we focus so much on, oh, we've got to stop these mussels from coming in. And yet they're probably a, a symptom of all of our pollution. Well, that, the pollution that polluted there. water is not yeah, natural ecosystem. Right. If the right. water was there, they wouldn't do as well. Yeah. yeah. So it's, yeah. It's, a, it's a complicated, it's, uh, uh, again, interesting. Total web. Yeah. Absolutely. For online, that was a comment about how they're actually, they are filters and, and they're cleaning yeah. up this polluted water in Lake Erie, um, uh, which they're not good for the natural ecosystem, and yet there's some benefits. And, yeah. Um, yeah. So, practical question. So as this era walks along these footprints, uh -huh. you would think that the mussels would be the most dense and the plants would be the, the tallest and the oldest. So they have time to grow rather than... Uh -uh. <laughs> so is that intentional or just artistic? I think, yeah, just that's a good point, actually. That's a good point. I think just the idea that the more proximity, I guess, sort of to, to the, the thing moving across um, the landscape, like the, the denser the stuff is. But yeah, I guess if you think about in practical terms, that would probably be true. But I wanted to go in from like a slightly, slightly more like just sort of actual marshy environment into this like more uh, irradiated kind of, you know, yeah, encrusted. <laughs> It makes sense visually. It doesn't make sense if you think about about time. Yeah, no, that's well, true. Well, if you think about time on um, on a Yuga scale, it makes a lot of sense, right? On a which scale? Uh, on the Yuga scale. Yeah, yeah. Right? enormous time. Um, because with with the globalization and the displacement, quagga mussels also uh, spread in direct correlation to human activities, including political changes, border skirmishes, um, uh, different different trading routes opening up. Those are moments when their populations bump elsewhere in the world. Yeah. Right? Um, environmental regulations, and they pop back up. Yeah. Um, and so the more human activity there is, the more they're, they're doing this because they don't do this in their natural habitat. In their natural habitat, they just exist instead of build structures made of themselves. And I think part of the visual that I had in my head when I started working on these footsteps, uh, the footprints themselves, was uh, the Studio Ghibli film Princess Mononoke and the, is Princess, yeah, it's Princess Mononoke. There's a forest spirit at one point that kind of goes from being this elk 
to being this like elongated, like Donnie Darko <laughs> kind of thing, and then sort of sails off into the sky every night. And as it walks, it's the things sprout up and then decay and die almost immediately in its footprint. So that's sort of like it's springing up behind it and then dying back down, I think was the sort of visual that I had in my head, but, I, but not consciously. I hadn't really thought about that until you asked. So, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, uh, since everybody follows us, let's let's take a walk. <laughs> let's, let's finish our cycle. Okay. Before we say goodbye and check again online if anybody has any questions in the comments section. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Send so everybody in the direction of sandwiches. <laughs> Send yeah. everybody in the direction of sandwiches. Um, so this is. Uh, a really good example of now that we're looking directly at this owl, we've already heard the story of it, but um, of this kind of cabin of curiosities work that you have done before in collaboration with with uh, research museums and things yeah. like that, right? Um, so this this found stool um, with this this branch, right? It's a it's a juxtaposition of the of the made and, and the natural, mm -hmm. right? And the, the displaced once again. So um, the uh, also there's there's uh, fake. Flora and real flora, right? Just growing out of it, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That it's, uh, yeah. Um, did you talk about the wool when you described this? Well, yeah, no, this particular piece, um, the wool is given to me by a, a farmer in Newfoundland. I have a relationships with a couple of, um, of growers out there, and uh, it was wool she had broken. I think she'd fallen off her horse and broken her arm <laughs> that season, and so she couldn't shear her sheep in time, and so she short, she, she, Shore them? That's not a word. She sheared them because they need to be shorn anyway, but the wool was more or less unusable for any kind of spinning or felting or anything. So she just gave them to me. And so I washed them out and cleaned them. And I just, I just love the texture of it. And yeah. I like, after having worked with more processed wool for so long, it's kind of fun to work with, st yeah, something that's just closer to the source. And, you know, that was as close to the source as you get, really. I was just like, well, it's lying on the ground in the manure, like, and washes off. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Now, I've never asked you this before. I don't yeah. want to put you on the spot, but like, so this one's like kind of wackier. It's like really cute right. and, and, you know, as opposed to the things that are not right. cute here. Well, I pulled this in, I pulled this into this series kind of at the last minute. It was something that I had made that I didn't know where it was going. Like I, I used it in a group show with a collective um, that I'm a part of in Edmondson. But then this story of this owl recently surfaced and I was like, ah, oh, like it's just, yeah. I'm just gonna pull it in. Yeah, it's not exactly the same species. Like I was gonna come back in and add like black barring and stuff to it. And it's just, there was only so much that could be done in the last week and a half. Um, but so when I had first started working on it, I think it was coming out of a, I don't know, a more imaginary kind of place. And so, you know, with this little, this little, the, I actually was building the face on a, just a cross of reed to, to get the shape to hold and then decided I actually really sort of liked just that, that I don't know, whatever, like the sort of vectors Well, I mean, they're really face. weird looking in real life, too. Yeah, they are. <laughs> so I, I took the one yeah. stick out and, and just put the stick from my backyard in and, and yeah. like his little, like, flippy, yeah. his little, one little flippy feather. Because <laughs> yeah. he's also, like, he's just sort of a blob. Like, he doesn't really have, like, his wings aren't evident, his tail isn't new. Mm -hmm. I originally sort of envisioning him just, like, blending into tundra, but... Um, but ultimately, I found that the real connection was with the fish, right? And these yeah. news stories, this kind of human interest, you know, isn't, yeah. isn't that interesting? And then they're talking to scientists in these news stories. They interview them, and they go, there's no cause for alarm. And right. Go, what? It's <laughs> still alarm. It's a little. Yeah, I'm a little yeah. alarmed. So, yeah. yeah. Are you sure? Has that been tested? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, which is different from a lot of the other displaced birds in the area where, like, yeah. you know, people had pet parrots or whatever and let them go, and now there's huge flocks of parrots. It's like this thing volunteered to go to LA from wherever, from Alaska or yeah. Yukon or wherever yeah. it came from. So, yeah. yeah. They live north of the tree line. They're from yeah. very, very far away. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Really? Oh, oh. Love to see one. That's actually something I haven't seen in real life. I'd love to. Yeah. But, yeah. Well. Okay. If there are no questions. Should we make everybody eat sandwiches? Yeah, let's go eat sandwiches. <laughs> Drink coffee thanks and eat sandwiches. Work. Thanks everybody online for joining. Um, and it'll be on um, YouTube and, and Facebook if you want to share or refer to this talk again later. So great. Come on. Let's, let's go. Thank you. <laughs> Yay! Yeah.